A gold standard is a monetary system in which the currency's value is entirely centered on the value of gold. This can either be accomplished by simply coining the gold, thus using the standard as the actual currency, or through issuing other forms of currency such as coins or paper money that are valued by the public based on the value of gold. The use of gold as a standard for currency has been a topic of much debate throughout the history of civilization. Due to its appearance and rarity, gold has, since its discovery, been a coveted source of worth and value in society. This inevitably led to its natural use as currency as early as, if not before, the Roman Empire. Though Rome eventually dropped gold as the standard in favor of the far more abundant silver, gold made many comebacks throughout history. In the United States, President Thomas Jefferson in 1806 suspended the minting of silver coins due to the severely increased debt as well as the severely decreased use of silver brought on by the Revolutionary War. Gold became the standard for currency in the United States in 1834 when Andrew Jackson's administration gold bill was passed into law. This decreased the value of silver in an attempt to phase it out as currency in favor of a system strictly based on gold. The Independent Treasury Act of 1848, signed by President James K. Polk, legally separated the federal budget and reserve from the banking system, allowing the government to only deal in gold and silver. This caused federal gold to drain due to its higher demand in other countries, particularly England. The overvaluation of silver caused it to become a more beneficial factor of currency. Silver began to find its way into the United States, causing gold to become less useful in trade. As silver became more abundant in the system, it became less valuable to the system, causing banks in the United States to suspend payment in silver. This was followed by a suspension of payment in gold and silver from the federal government. These events both became major factors that led to the Civil War and defeated silver as a viable standard for currency. The Fourth Coinage Act of 1873, signed by President Ulysses S. Grant, demonetized silver and brought the United States into a full-fledged gold standard. While no legal papers stated that the United States was using a gold standard, it was de facto. The act also gave the United States Department of Treasury full jurisdiction over the United States Mint and established four mints in Carson City, Denver, Philadelphia, and San Francisco. In 1878, Representative Richard P. Bland, a Democrat from Missouri, and Senator William B. Allison, a Republican from Iowa, proposed the Bland-Allison Act, which required the United States Treasury to buy silver at a price higher than its actual worth in order to allow silver back into circulation. President Rutherford B. Hayes vetoed the bill, stating that a currency worth less than it purports to be worth will in the end defraud not only creditors, but all who are engaged in legitimate business, and none more surely than those who are dependent on their daily labor for their daily bread. Congress overrode Hayes' veto and made the Bland-Allison Act law. Many supporters of silver, known as Silverites, didn't think the Bland-Allison Act went far enough. They believed that in order to return silver to the playing field of economics, silver would have to be allowed to be traded as high as a 16 to 1 ratio to gold, the same ratio used to phase silver out of circulation by the Administration Gold Act of 1834. The Treasury decided to buy and mint only the absolute minimum amount of silver, about $2 million worth. The people also realized that the actual worth of silver was less than the worth of gold, leading to a massive drain of the Treasury's gold reserve. The Treasury began to issue bonds to banks in exchange for gold, but this did not quench the thirst. President Grover Cleveland, a strong supporter of the gold standard, asked Congress to repeal the Bland-Allison Act, but they refused to do so. The attempt by the executive branch to once again deflate silver angered many Southerners and Westerners who wanted money to be cheap so that they could more easily sell their crops and other goods in their current economy. In 1886, Bland attempted to pass another silver bill, this time presenting one that would have required the government to mint an unlimited amount of silver that would have severely inflated the currency. President Benjamin Harrison tried his best while in office to please both the silverites and the gold bugs, the supporters of the gold standard. Harrison supported the silver standard and appointed former Senator William Wyndham, a Republican from Minnesota as well as a fellow silverite, as Secretary of the Treasury. He also supported the free coinage of silver at its own value rather than based on a fixed value to gold. This position proved to displease both sides of the debate. A Republican senator from Ohio named John Sherman proposed a bill, the Sherman Silver Purchase Act of 1890, which would require the Treasury to buy and mint no less than $4.5 million worth of silver each month, thus replacing the Bland-Allison Act and inflating silver even more. Though the bill was controversial, Harrison believed it would end the debate over gold and silver, so he signed it post-haste. 
Unfortunately, what the bill did was create a greater use of silver, and this mixed with the ever-apparent demand for gold in international commerce continued to drain the federal government of its gold supply. Immediately following Grover Cleveland's inauguration and return to the presidency, a severe economic depression broke out. The drainage of gold from the federal government, partnered with the overbuilding and inevitable bankruptcy of several railroads, led to what is now known as the Panic of 1893. The American people attempted to redeem their silver for gold at banks, while Europe attempted to do the same through the United States federal government. But the gold had been so utterly depleted by this point that it was impossible for the banks or the government to appease anyone. Banks then began to fail as people began to withdraw all of their money. The United States had in only a few months gone from an unemployment rate of between 3 and 4 percent to anywhere from 8 to 12 percent. In total, more than 15,000 companies and over 500 banks failed due to the Depression. Cleveland believed that the Panic of 1893 had been caused most prominently by the Sherman Silver Purchase Act and called Congress to a special session in order to repeal it. In his public message to Congress, he stated that, immediately following a spasmodic and slight rise, the price of silver began to fall after the passage of the act and has since reached the lowest point ever known. At this stage, gold and silver must part company and the government must fail in its established policy to maintain the two metals on a parity with each other. Given over to the exclusive use of a currency greatly depreciated according to the standard of the commercial world, we could no longer claim a place among nations of the first class, nor could our government claim a performance of its obligation, so far as such an obligation has been imposed upon it, to provide for the use of the people the best and safest money. The people of the United States are entitled to a sound and stable currency and to money recognized as such on every exchange and in every market of the world. Their government has no right to injure them by financial experiments opposed to the policy and practice of other civilized states, nor is it justified in permitting an exaggerated and unreasonable reliance on our national strength and ability to jeopardize the soundness of the people's money. The debate was fierce, not only in Congress but among politicians and citizens alike. At the time, a future Democratic senator from South Carolina named Ben Tillman, who was running for his seat at the time, stated that Cleveland is an old bag of beef and I am going to Washington with a pitchfork and prod him in his fat old ribs, and that when Judas betrayed Christ, his heart was not blacker than this scoundrel, Cleveland, in deceiving. Despite this and many other comments of similar ilk, the Sherman Silver Purchase Act was repealed in late 1893. While the repeal helped to ease the government's woes, the effects were not immediate, as many people were still attempting to exchange outstanding silver notes for gold. By this point, the United States Treasury was almost entirely dry, and it seemed as if the supply would only continue to weather. It was at this moment that J.P. Morgan, a wealthy financier, offered his services to Cleveland. He suggested that the president buy 3.5 million ounces of gold from European bankers through long-term bonds. This was initiated, allowing the government to provide gold once more and saving the economy from becoming completely destroyed. The investment was met with much controversy, however, most prominently due to Morgan having made roughly $7 million for his idea. Ben Tillman once again became vocal, calling Cleveland a besotted tyrant for his dealings with gold and Europe alike. Cleveland was not active in the 1896 presidential election. He was ready to retire, but became furious with the man chosen by the Democrats to replace him. William Jennings Bryan, a former Democratic representative of Nebraska, was a bimetallic supporter known for being a gifted orator as well as being an evangelical. He spoke at the Democratic National Convention that year in Chicago with a great passion for an end to the gold standard. We go forth confident that we shall win. Why? Because upon the paramount issue of this campaign, there is not a spot of ground upon which the enemy will dare to challenge battle. If they tell us that the gold standard is a good thing, we shall point to their platform and tell them that their platform pledges the party to get rid of the gold standard and substitute by metallism. I call your attention to the fact that some of the very men who are in this convention today and who tell us that we ought to declare in favor of international by metallism, thereby declaring the gold standard is wrong and that the principle of bimetallism is better, These very people, four months ago, were open and avowed advocates of the gold standard and were then telling us that we could not legislate two metals together even with the aid of all the world. If the gold standard is a good thing, we ought to declare in favor of its retention and not in favor of abandoning it. And if the gold standard is a bad thing, why should we wait until other nations 
or willing to help us to let go. If they tell us that the gold standard is the standard of civilization, we reply to them that this, the most enlightened of all the nations of the earth, has never declared for a gold standard, and that both the great parties this year are declaring against it. More than that, they will search the pages of history in vain to find a single instance where the common people of any land have ever declared themselves in favor of the gold standard. They can find where the holders of fixed investments have declared for a gold standard, but not for the masses have. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Despite all of Jennings' passion, he lost to the Republican candidate William McKinley, a former Republican representative and governor of Ohio who ran in favor of the gold standard. In 1900, McKinley signed the Gold Standard Act, which formally put an end to bimetallism in the United States. This allowed the country to grow and thrive for almost three decades until the Great Depression, at which point gold reserves began to dry out again and gold became less viable as a monetary standard. In 1971, President Richard Nixon canceled the ability to convert dollars to gold, thus ending the United States' long run with the gold standard. Today, there is still much debate over whether or not the gold standard can truly be successful. With the national debt higher than ever thought possible and a lingering recession with no end in sight, support for the return of the gold standard has increased in recent years. In March of 2011, Utah became the first state in 40 years to allow citizens to exchange money directly for gold and silver. Whether one supports a standard in gold, silver, bimetallism, or any other fashion, it cannot be denied that this debate has shaped much of today's current economic understandings.